Hello um, and welcome to another series of interviews uh, on citiesabc.com video podcast by me, Denise Guarda. Um, so this is a, a, a privilege that I've been having to uh, interview world leading personalities, thought leaders, CEOs and people shifting and changing the world we live. And as well coming up with positive solutions and creative, innovative, uh, both technology, technological or books or ideas that actually can make us look better. Um, and as well, look at uh, better ways of get, thinking out of the box and looking at tackling the problems we're facing in the world. Um, we have a world driven by technology where the fourth industrial revolution is um, coming all over the place and society 5.0, but we have still a lot of challenges underway and we still have a huge amount of disparities. And of course, we are going through a huge challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic that is affecting the world economy, the world society and especially our health. Um, so these podcasts and videos are part of the platform that I co-founded, uh, citiesabc.com. That is a new uh, wiki for AR Society 5.0 Intelligent Smart Cities platform that looks at ways of reinventing our cities, our, our society, our infrastructure organizations, and of course, improve our life as citizens. Um, so today we're going precisely in the areas of healthcare. And we have with us um, Mark, Dr. L Mark Lomax, um, that is a seasonal healthcare entrepreneur and medical doctor, and previously founded and built and sold an award-winning award business, Medeom, uh, which is a very interesting project. And he has key customers um, in the past as NHS, of course, is a UK-based doctor, so NHS is, is the biggest healthcare organization for the ones they're seeing from already all over the world and um, as well is still working in the ways how to crack the NHS, which is a big challenge, especially for the UK, given what is happening with COVID-19. So Mark is, uh, it has an experience both raising capital, but as well it has a medical background in healthcare, and um, he created the organization and company pephealth.ai, that is, as the name mentions, focus on looking at data and solutions around the areas of healthcare, um, looking at data to improve decisions and high performance teams and as well delivering commercial and um, optimized uh, infrastructure architecture and solutions to our organizations like uh, NHS and is expanding right now internationally. So uh, Mark, welcome to our podcast. A pleasure to Thank have you here. Yeah, great. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for the intro. That was a, that was a great intro. Thank you very much. Cheers. No, I think it's, uh, it's, I know that everyone working in healthcare and technology deserves my respect. <laughs> it's probably the <laughs> most sensitive area of technology in the world and as well the most, the fast growing one, but the one that has more risks and more considerations, but as well the one more necessary. Um, so Mark, I think to start and I think being a doctor, I would like to hear your experience how as a doctor, you passed from being a doctor to be a serial entrepreneur and as well right now building technology companies to serve uh, healthcare and solutions in medical care and so forth. Uh, this is yeah. one of the areas that I've been quite excited. So I want to hear about your X3 and your profile. So, so yeah, my, my, my journey then really, well, obviously it started with training and being a, a junior doctor working in hospitals, both in the UK, but, but overseas as well. And I think for me, there was always a frustration about what was happening and what I was seeing around the world that I was operating in. And I, I, was, I, I couldn't change it from inside as a lowly junior doctor. And it was one of great frustration to me. And so I had the idea for my first business, Medihome, which you mentioned, which was really back then trying to change where patients received care and getting them out of hospital and treating them at home. And it was an idea that I'd seen from international best practice elsewhere that we weren't using in the UK. So rather naively, which has actually probably been a real strength of me, sort of going, certainly in the early days of believing that it's the right thing to do, regardless of how many people said no, and that it wasn't the right thing to do. But we made it work, sort of, but it was, it was a tough, tough challenge to make the, the system adopt a new system and an innovative way of looking after patients. And through that time, had to grow it from scratch, raise the funding, build the team, build up the IP and the know-how to actually make it work. But by the time we successfully exited, we were, we were saving the NHS over a million pounds a month and growing sort of 40% per annum and sort of a, the sort of service that 
I really loved being a part of because it was a win-win. The patients loved it. The the purchasers loved it because it was cheaper, and and we had a successful business. So sort of for me, it was ethical and it was sustainable and doing things in the right way. Since then, thinking through my sort of underlying passion of trying to really transform healthcare and make it better, my my roads moved much more towards data and using the power of data to make better decisions and to make those impacts with more evidence and better insights. And so about this time last year, I was introduced to the the founding team of Pep Health, who had developed an absolutely fantastic technical solution, but it hadn't been used in the real world in terms of bringing it to life and bringing that focus to uh, to us, to, to the users in the health system. And so I joined as CEO, and from day one when I first saw it, I had this feeling that this was a really novel way of using data that's already out there and converting it into insights that really enable us to be timely and impactful with real world data. And it's one of those problems that people try and crack, but my goodness, it's been a difficult problem to track, but uh, we think we've done it and we're, we're really excited about what that can do into the future. I know that is uh, special looking at the present day challenges related with the COVID-19 and things like that. It's, uh, this, this field is a major complexity and the, there's the technology, there's the data, there's the management of data, there's the architecture systems and there's a lot of different things. So I would like to hear, um, and especially let's start with MediHome and I would like to hear a bit more about the history of MediHome. Um, and then from MediHome to, Pep, uh, to pephealth.ai. So, can you just give us a bit of a background on that? I think it's particularly important because there's thousands of uh, companies right now creating solutions for healthcare that very few succeed. And I think especially going mainstream and working with organizations as big as the, as the national healthcare system like NHS, for the ones that don't know about the UK system, is particularly critical. And as well, we have, of course, the US, which is even more fragmented uh, and broken. But yeah, just want to hear about your background. Well, I mean, it's it's funny how sort of over what the last 10, 20 years, uh, some of the issues, have, really it's COVID has magnified underlying issues and just really sort of shown what works and what doesn't work very quickly. Um, MediHome as a business was really, and, as a, and the reason to be was to look after people at home who'd otherwise be in hospital. And back in when we founded the business or when I founded the business, it was one of working in a hospital and just looking at all these patients in bed after bed after bed who needed some care but not a full hospital level of care provision and that it was only because there was a lack of alternative solutions that these unfortunate patients needed to stay in hospital so we developed a way of having pathways to support them in their home environment that kept them safe kept them monitored gave them their treatments which actually back then was a mixture of probably more feet on the ground with nurses and others delivering some of the care. I think if we were doing it today, we could have used technology much more heavily, but we still had technology supporting us with electronic patient record systems and monitoring devices so that we could really track those patients, know what was happening to them. And what we discovered pretty quickly was... um, not really a huge surprise to people in the health industry, but hospitals are not the best place to be for a whole variety of reasons. Um, you can get infections there, which I suppose is obviously sort of magnified with, with COVID, but plenty of others too. Uh, they're actually just noisy places and they're not good places to rest. You don't get the privacy that you get in your own home and you don't eat the food that you'd like in your own home. And it makes you a bit tenser and psychologically that has an effect on you. And the upshot of all those different issues is that people at home get better quicker pain is less they move around more they get their strength back uh, they're more relaxed and they get their independence back quicker and all those things are really important for the long term so as well as being able to have a business that saved money day for day like for like um, the longer term impact of those patients was fantastic and saved even more money for the for the health system and what we did was we worked with a variety of nhs hospitals and in essence we provided them with virtual wards so they didn't need to build the facilities and we would take 
a ward full of patients for, from them, look after them in their own homes. And uh, we did that with a view to, no matter what the contract says, we always wanted to establish a long-term relationship and always do what's right for the patient and always do what's right for the, the system overall. And I mean, that's stead us in really good stead as a business. And just as we exited, we'd actually been starting to look at our own international plans. And um, in the Middle East, there was quite a bit of interest and uh, sort of different parts of the world were sort of coming to us to see how we would actually being able to provide such excellent care uh, across the board. So it was a great result and one I'm personally very proud about. And then um, one of our challenges then was that we just couldn't recruit enough staff and health workers are in short supply globally. And one of the reasons now why I suppose data is just so much more important as well and trying to automate certain parts of the, the system to support health workers because there's so much to do and there are so many people demanding services like like in present day times we, with covid on our minds that we have to uh, we have to think about things differently and that's sort of maybe sort of a an into uh, to the pep health story as well dennis and i think it, so i, wa- I want to go through the the angles so being a doctor and having the experience uh, working both in, in hospitals and in healthcare um, facilities and then creating a startup so um or creating startups in this case and a lot of different ventures so how do you see the challenge because i think one of the things i see and this is across the board worldwide is that actually doctors have a fantastic education and i've been actually teaching digital healthcare so a lot of doctors have been passing through me at least in the last 10 years um well at least phd is related with pharmace- pharmaceutical in my case and i found that um First of all, there's a lack of digital education. Okay, uh, that's big, alarming, and actually even among young people. And then, secondly, when you go to institutions, it's even more serious. But but we have a part, of, uh, kind of a a big, um, um, I would say, uh, it's a paradox. In one end, we have our devices that have all our data. So if you go any iPhone or Samsung or Huawei or stuff like that, there's more data about us than any of our hospitals and healthcare centers. And we can see even with a simple uh, Apple, Samsung, or Huawei watch, you can actually see your healthcare, more or less understanding a lot of these things. But then you go to the hospital, and even for a small thing, it's a complete nightmare. Um, and this is worldwide. It's not just, we cannot just criticize one country versus the other. There might be some exceptions, but there are exceptions, not the rule. So how come we are in this situation? Because it it's really it doesn't make any sense. Like you said you, in your first... Uh, startup, you save millions of dollars per month to to an organization like NHS, but a lot of these things is really common sense. Um, so, where are we failing? And for us, if you look at the UK, which is the fifth to seventh uh, world economy, and it was I think the second or fourth country with more devs after Italy and the US and, and and Brazil right now. So, how come something like this happened? And this is something that gets me very nervous. I, I know partly, but I I think someone like you it. it I want to hear, hear from a, an expert and as well an industry uh, uh, professional. Uh, there's such a paradox here. It's, um, it, it's, it's crazy. And I think the only way I can rationalize it in my own mind is that sort of doctors, healthcare professionals generally, the health system across the board is probably the most risk averse industry there is on the planet and some of that for really good reason that we want to not do any harm to patients and a lot of people it's the the first thing you're taught is do no harm and sort of make sure that that's the case before you you go ahead and do anything else and it's it's a good starting point but the problem with that is it makes people incredibly risk averse And it also makes them not want to try new things or to try and explore opportunities that might work better. Nobody ever gets in trouble for doing what people have always done in the health system. And there's not enough celebration of the people that do things differently. And yes, we need to make sure that people are kept safe because it's of paramount importance, but it doesn't mean we always just have to do the same thing and always rely on the safety of familiarity and even that sort of case of sort of what we do is always historically at least safe is not actually true anyway 
Um, we know globally that in hospitals around the world, 10 to 12 percent of patients will experience some form of harm that comes to them uh, either by accident or misunderstanding, miscommunication, whatever it might be. And half of all those patients that come to some form of harm, half of that is half of those patients are, it's preventable. And that's a huge number around the world. In the UK alone, it equates to 11,000 deaths per annum that happen uh, every year that are completely avoidable if we did things differently. And it's a shocking figure, and it's not actually sort of a, a figure that makes the UK an outlier. It's the same absolutely everywhere. And so we do need to improve how we deliver services and how we, how we understand what's there. People have known this data for a long time, but nobody's actually been able to make a difference yet. And even though the understanding of it's much better, the, the ability to make a change, it's just so difficult. Um, it's sort of in my first sort of at the start, I sort of mentioned about how myself being naive was a good thing. And it absolutely is almost still to this day in that if you think about how hard it is to change the cultural machine and that inertia that sits there, you you need a slightly crazy personality or something slightly out of tilt to want to have a go at changing it because there's so many easy way, easier ways to earn a living or to have a job and have a happy life um you've really got to want to persevere and change to try and change the world because it's it's definitely not easy <laughs> so uh but it's uh it's something that when it works it just th there's no better feeling so uh, i suppose that's why i keep on coming back to it to uh, keep on trying to do it no no that's it's about the passion as well like you said i think if you want to change the world you have to perceive persevere and you have to be very patient i think people <laughs> they face that uh, the patience and persistence are aligned and as well the passion but it's not easy so i want to so looking at uh, uh pephealth.ai so i think one of the things you're trying to do is is with your platform automatically identifying and gather millions of public available feedback from variety of online platforms including social media, which is a massive thing. So how do you gather this data and this sentiment and uh, how do you customize your algorithms to score the feedback and providing a curate and uh, an unbiased and, uh, a summary? Because this is a big thing. And as well, probably the second part, of course, is how you handle with data protection. Yeah, yeah. No, plenty of big issues that we've had to crack with this one, for sure. Uh, and the the founding team and uh, Alex and Megan, who came up with the idea, were working in healthcare and realising that people were trying to make sense of this and nobody had been able to, to do it. What we've developed is a way of collecting data from a variety of different sources. And for us, we don't really mind what that platform is as long as they're real patients talking about their care that we can we we can listen to so the likes of twitter facebook um create millions of comments for us but there's online review sites as well where particular patients can go and talk um, in the uk we have a big one used to be called nhs choices now called nhs.uk where people can post their experiences and they're in their own rights, they're all quite useful, but they have limitations, each and every one of them. Uh, the online review sites takes a bit of effort to, for anyone to go and find them. And usually you only go and do that if you're very happy or very upset. And that can be important learnings. But what we really wanted was to try and capture as much of the population from a demographic point of view, as many comments as possible to make it as rich an experience and as rich an insight as we could generate. So we've had to create slightly different solutions for every platform and we collect it all together in real time. Uh, and that data collection runs to millions of comments per, per, per month that we collect nowadays. Uh, with our focus predominantly on the UK, but certainly sort of we're starting to build up our roadmap of where else we want to start collecting data around the globe as well. When we collect that data in its raw form, what we're doing is we only collect the publicly available data. Um, there's lots of private messaging and lots of things that people have sort of don't want to be known. But what we do is we just take the publicly facing data where the patients themselves, their family members, the carers have wanted that to be expressed and for people to hear about it. 
really either so that people can learn from it or that sort of people can really uh, appreciate what's happened or, or pass on their thanks. And so we take that publicly available data and we give every comment, we do several things with it. We give every comment a score from one to five um, based on what hundreds of thousands of patients had already scored their comments with. And we use that as a starting data set to match comments so that we we give a like for like scoring for every single comment. And uh, that gives us a real time overall score. For, for each hospital when they all get added up together and that score that we generate we we've been able to prove that it's an accurate predictor of what the regulator in the uk uh, they're called the cqc uh, it's an accurate predictor of what their inspectors will rate the the patient the, the hospital with uh, so it's it's not just a score it's something that really matters and is a really good indicator of those hospitals that are doing an outstanding job and those that are really struggling and need some support or help the next things we do is we're able to tag and break apart those comments that patients make in a variety of ways so depending on the language and the lexicon they use we can link it to departments inside a hospital so it might be about the disease they talk about or the operation they've had or the sort of other other clues that they might give us from what they describe in their free text and we then tag those comments to those departments so we can drill down into the hospital so that we and we can compare and see where different places are doing particularly well or not and as, on that basis well we can score to the department level and we also can theme the comments into eight internationally recognized quality domains, things that matter in health care everywhere. And they're things like the speed of being able to access health services, how effective was the treatment, how well were you cared for, how well were you given information about it and being able to be involved in decision making and what kind of physical environment was it like when you had your care. And so we can theme all the comments by these different domains and again, each one gets a different score. So with our machine learning, we're constantly improving it, but already we're at over 90% accuracy with all these domains and quite often sort of over 95%. And we, with that, we can accurately work out at a hospital level, at a departmental level, the strengths, the weaknesses. For the first time ever in the UK, we can compare hospitals like for like and see how are they performing and if it was maternity services or cancer services we, we can look at those individually and it gives us such a fascinating window in terms of what patients are experiencing and also how that's tracking over time are they finding it a better experience or a worse experience and why importantly is that change happening and this is something that people have wanted and called for, for for a very long time now. And nobody's been able to generate such real time insights. And so for those individuals themselves, it can mean a better experience. Uh, but it also means that we can learn as a as a system as, and as a healthcare system wanting to do better. Uh, we always can do better. And this is what we think is a perfect tool to drive that improvement and to reduce the mistakes and then to improve the quality. Fantastic. And, and for instance, um, on this collection of data, which is um, I like to look at this from a data ownership perspective and from a GDPR, although in the UK right now is getting out of the European Union, so it's going to be probably a lot of different, different directions, especially country by country. Um, I know that in the US, there's a huge amount of considerations around the privacy of data and privacy of especially healthcare data. And of course, in social media, we saw as well with Cambridge Analytica in particular, the consequences of using especially social metric data, uh, the consequences this can, can correct. So how do you look at this collection and listing and understanding what the patients say about their care? And at the same time, you, kept, you keep this privacy and this layer of respect towards the data in a way that, um, first of all, you don't, you don't incur in potential issues, uh, legal and, and in terms of security and cybersecurity but as well to protect their patient voice. Because I, I, I've been working in multiple projects, for instance, one of the, the, the conferences I was involved, we were discussing, for instance, uh, in the case of one of the biggest um, healthcare companies in the world, they were looking, for instance, in terms of, if you look, for instance, in segments like cancer data, and what, uh, for instance, if you look at what each different cancer 
um, patient is talking on blogs on on websites this this has a big impact on other patients but as the, at the same time it's a very sensitive address if you engage with these patients and some of them that potential are going to die or others that are dead already but there's still data about them online how do you look at this kind of very sensitive particularities of the data and the sensibility about sentiment around that so hugely important topic um obviously and w we've taken it really seriously from the from the start several or regularly we go back and really revise our policies and our thinking around this to make sure that we're we're not only just being legally compliant but we're being ethical and we're being appropriate and professional in, in how we go about doing all of this so for us it means several things it means that the the piece around making sure that the comments that we collect were comments that the uh, the patient really wanted to be known about and were, were wanting to make put into the public domain for the benefit of others or for the benefit of themselves so we we're, we're very careful about that and we record and tag in our databases exactly the level of um, public facingness that the uh, the comments have so for instance is it a comment that was put on the official facebook page of a hospital which is then quite easy to sort of see that they wanted to uh, to make that hospital know about their comments or did they did they hashtag it in some fashion wanting them to make the link uh, to to somebody to hopefully sort of raise that raise that uh, profile and that comment so we capture all of that We've done a lot of work with patient engagement groups and really sort of thinking it through from uh, wanting to make sure that patients trust the idea and they trust us as an organisation because we really want to make ourselves the white knight of patients and to give patients that clearer, stronger voice that they've not really had before en masse. Uh, some patients might have a huge following on Twitter and they get a lot of attention and that's fantastic for them. But what about all the other patients who don't have that ability to, to really reach as many people as, uh, as that? And so we, we, we really give a very um, democratic ability to, 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 to do that. We're very careful with the comments about what we do with them and sort of how they get shared. And obviously sort of security and our, our responsibility to look after them is, is, is key and essential. Uh, and make sure that we're, uh, we're, we're sort of treating it uh, appropriately, securely and sort of how we share it. If we have somebody who's working with us as a, as a partner uh, and they're, they're, they're using our data to improve their services, then what we're able to do is we're able to provide them hyperlinks back to the originating comments so that if somebody says they had a bad experience and it was sort of uh, something that they need to follow up with, we can actually link them back sort of through the original tweets or Facebook page or whatever it might be so that they can actually uh, do something with it. But if that individual wants them to delete that comment or they decided it was no longer appropriate and they delete it, and then it, it falls out of the system and then uh, it's deleted as well. So uh, it's entirely, even if patients don't realise that we're able to listen to their comments, they are actually still completely in control depending on what they do with their commentary. And if they delete it, then, then it falls out from our system as well. Yeah, that's, that's important because it's a, it's a major uh well, a major uh, element in anything related to healthcare, special sentiment data, and, and, and as well patient data, but as well patient insights and sentiment, because of course this has massive, massive considerations. Imagine if someone that is involved in a corporation, and I know as well that uh, within the platform, you have as well uh, an area related with, um, especially with insurance, uh, providers and regulators. So how do you make the bridge between the providers, okay, the insurers and commissioners and regulators. So there's, there's I suppose, well, everyone within the health system is interested in what patients experience because they're ultimately the consumers of, of the health system. Um, different people in it are looking for different things from the data. And so we're able to, if you like, sort of adjust our value proposition and what we're able to offer them in slightly different ways. So, from a, a regulator point of view, what we can do for a regulator is we can really be a risk management tool to stratify the, the hospitals or the clinics, whatever it might be, and say, 
in the eyes of the patients, and this is not our opinion, this is purely the opinion of the patients en masse, and relying on the, the phenomenon of the wisdom of crowds where large scale numbers of people can be very accurate in their in their assessments we we can sort of stratify that risk and say these are the best and these are the ones in the middle and there's a group in the the lower quartile let's say for instance where you might want to focus your energies as a as a risk management tool we don't need to provide the regulator necessarily with any commentary from the individual patients we can just give them that high level overview of what happens to give them the signposting as to what happens the insurers are more interested in it from the provider side than from the individual side uh, they're very mindful as well about the whole data protection side and the, the sensitivities around that individual data. But what they do want to make sure is that if people are holding private medical cover, they're getting a good experience and that they're also getting what they should be getting from, uh, from the contract with the provider. And so they're able to both help keep an eye on the quality of what's provided, but it can also help them with the signposting and helping patients themselves decide where they want to go for care. If you're living in a city and there's 10 different hospitals that you can pick from, how do you pick which is the best 10? You can maybe do some research on the, on the doctors and decide which doctor you want to go to. But what about the actual hospitals themselves and the experience there? Um, you can look at their websites, but, you can only get so much from the, their own websites. So we can provide sort of that assessment of patients pre, <coughs> excuse me, previously who've been through there can, are, are saying this about that service. And so it could be a really insightful tool to help navigate patients and help patients themselves decide which way they want to uh, access services. And that's really what insurers at the moment are really thinking about as it being a real, really positive way for help them manage their risk, but also to help empower their, their, their users as well. I know that uh, um, when it comes to, to our cities and our countries, and we touched the, the issues with healthcare, uh, with COVID-19 that accelerated the digital transformation, but we have a fundamental still failure in terms of looking at the models of uh, improving the, especially the healthcare infrastructure and wellness, to prevent issues in health, although we have already the technology to accelerate that. And of course, I'm sure that you uh, and your company right now have a huge amount of insights that you can actually share and actually that can create a lot of valuable um, ways of uh, monitoring and even predicting things. So how do you see the, the health care in the context of these areas of Society 5.0 and 4AR and as well in the, all the areas of, of digital transformation, especially with platforms like yours. Um, do you think we can actually accelerate these? Uh, I know that we have the challenge with, with the, the organizations, the legacy systems and different things, but how can we, what's your vision on that? Uh, being in your second healthcare company and as well dealing with a lot of data and a lot of insights and, and research, because I think what you're doing is scientific research by all means, especially when you include the machine learning and all these different areas of getting this assessment of data and insights? I think the, the next five years will see more transformation in health systems than we've ever seen ever before globally. And how are we going to do that? It's, it's a mighty problem. And the problem has only been magnified with, with COVID and the, the effect of that. What we're seeing is that sort of using the UK as an example, that a lot of routine activity had just stopped overnight when COVID started. And there's now a huge amount of concern and focus about resetting the health service, how to restart cancer services, elective surgery, so on and so forth. Um, where are all those patients that would have otherwise have been treated? And at the moment, it's more a question that's been posed without having an answer to back it up as to what do we do about it. And it's something that's going to become increasingly urgent because the backlog is still growing and it's going to be growing around the globe. Hospitals, health systems are not going to be able to cope with the pent up demands that's been built up over this time. And so we're going to have to really think differently about how we go about doing it. Unfortunately, I think there's going to be some really difficult decisions about prioritising patients and what really needs to be delivered when. And 
the better decisions will be made where people are have got the best data at their fingertips that is coordinated data that is accurate that's real time and is able to be triangulated from a variety of different sources to really give a level of um, accuracy and confidence that what it's indicating is correct and i think with that in mind there's a lot of quantitative data that's generally out there uh, but there's very little qualitative data that people can rely on. And that's really where we're so excited about wanting to work with other partners and other providers to bring that quantitative and qualitative data together. Um, if somebody has to decide which health services are the ones to keep and which ones maybe need to stop for a year or two, what's the patient view on that? What's, what do patients value the most and what are the things that really matter to them? Um, it's an important question, but at the one at the moment that people really can't answer at all well. And that's where we really want to um, offer those insights and offer that intelligence so that we can design services that fit for the future and can design services that can really last into the, the years ahead, but also be tailored so that depending on new pressures, new events, um, it makes it more interesting to, or more useful to see what's happening. At the moment in the UK, for example, we can track what the patient sentiment is around the ability to access health services, which is hugely relevant now, but will be relevant in the years ahead. Um, where can they access services and what are people doing there locally that means that patients are able to access services so well and can we take those learnings from those sites and take it to the other areas where maybe patients can't access the services so well and are complaining about the the difficulty that they've got um quite often somewhere in the health system lies the answer but that learning and tracking and monitoring is at the moment so far behind the curve it needs to be brought to light so that everything from the national bodies, governments, through to local hospitals, can all really have their fingertips on this data to make better decisions for the future. So one of the things on that level that I'm particularly uh, interested to know, so, so when you start getting this kind of intelligence, you can actually, like you said, uh, for instance, there was a couple of companies that were trying to put, for instance, in a huge amount of data of healthcare in the blockchain and for instance if you put a, a smart contract with all this data then it can create insights it can create patterns and it can save billions of people but you can as well use it for wrong like the nazis tried to do with the first ibm machines during the second world war so uh you are dealing with machine learning and a lot of these things to clean the data and to improve and to create prediction around data so how do you see the the bridge between especially as as uh, artificial intelligence becomes more advanced um, and touches everything related. And as well, we have already a lot of insights because we know as well, for instance, with just 23 and me platforms, you can actually already understand the prediction from your DNA to have cancer, to have other uh, particular issues. But at the same time, we are still failing as humanity. So in terms of companies and innovation, we are there and we are quite advanced, but as humanity, we're failing. So how do you see especially this, this kind of a duality in terms of companies like yours that are really getting very advanced and then the rest of society not, but as well with AI coming in the middle of this, because we're creating almost, oh, there's already scientists and people like Peter Thiel that are investing hundreds of millions of dollars to extend life. Um, and that's in the entire new industry of longevity technology and so forth. So I would like to hear about this. As I interviewed recently Ben Gortzel, that has been looking at, um, especially behind the Singularity Nets and OpenCog, and has been working in extending life forms of artificial intelligence but I, I want to go through the basics. How you see artificial intelligence in general in the healthcare industry, you being that you are using a machine learning specific for cleaning data, but how do you see this going forward? Oh, it's, um, I, it, it's a fascinating question, isn't it? And it's, um, I can only give my own personal view on this because it's, it's, it's a mighty, it's a big old, it's a big question. I mean, I think, the technical side of it, we have pretty much cracked the, the challenges, but the, the bits that you're touching on, which I think are going to be the really interesting debates, are enabling the public to understand what's happening and what the art of the possible is. And to do that conversation in public and with a, treating people as, as citizens of the globe and being, enabling them to 
partly have uh, their, their ability to influence the direction of policy and the direction of usage. But also for the for the likes of ourselves, the ethics around this are massive. And for me, the ethics of AI is, is one of the most interesting bits. Um, how do we know which are the corporately responsible organizations who are developing AI today and who are the ones that, that, that are not? Um, how do the public know and what's the way of being able to tell the difference between them? Um, there is so much good that AI can do for humanity but it can equally turn on its head and be done for uh, for, 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 for bads as well equally so at this stage I mean I don't think there's any easy answer to that but what people need to do is they need to look at each one in its own might and really understand the purpose of what's driving each company what's their what's their vision and what are they trying to achieve and is 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 their purpose one that the public global citizens think is one that actually benefits them or could benefit them uh, or not. And so we're we're, we're very sensitive about it, not least because we're in the healthcare space and really wanting to make sure that uh, we make a transformation to patients and really make that positive inroads. So we're, uh, we're early on on our journey, but it's certainly a journey that we welcome the public debate and we really want to be part of that public debate to help patients and the public understand what's there. But equally, politicians, senior managers in healthcare systems, there's a lot of understanding and awareness that is is lacking in all sorts of different ways. And it's something where training and education really need to play its role to really help everyone come along on this journey. So one of the questions I have, so uh, and I think coming back to your products and to your platform, so you were uh, recently um, uh, awarded by the UK Award for Innovation, uh, especially in the areas of innovative uh, uh, patient experience platform to expand the support of operational response throughout COVID-19 outbreak and behind by, utter, by better understanding the user voice. So uh, congratulations, first of all, but uh, could you tell us a bit about um, how this uh, a grant by the UK innovation uh, entity uh, is going to expand. This was recent during COVID-19. And all you doing right now, for instance, looking at the challenge that you face with COVID-19 and this data integration into systems of health and the NHS and so forth. Yeah, so we were absolutely delighted to win the Innovate UK competition. Um, the competition that we won was um, it was for early stage UK technologies uh, and looking for the best in class that were there across all industries. So it was a, it was a pan industry competition. So delighted to have won that. And the funding really helps in a number of ways what we're able to do. Um, it really helps us accelerate our delivery and our infrastructure so that we can operate at a greater scale and do more things more quickly ourselves. Um, one of the things that the money has been um, sort of one, one of the, the, the angles is is obviously COVID, which was uh, things like the speed of access and understanding what patients are saying through COVID and developing specific COVID tools to really help uh, the healthcare system understand that, uh, that, that sentiment behind patients. Also, though, uh, international expansion was quite a big feature of that. And so next year, we're really looking towards our expansion into the US. And so I'm going to be reaching out shortly, seeking US partners to to come with us on that on that particular piece of work that we're keen to do. Uh, we think the US is the, the largest healthcare system in the in the world and the, the nature of how it's built up was particularly relevant and useful for uh, for our, to, our tool to be in situ there. So we're, we're really excited excited about doing that um, and so we, we, we but we, we want to do several things we want to we want to grow internationally and we want to grow the the breadth of the solution at the moment we, we look at hospitals in the UK we want to move into primary care we want to move into social care uh, be able to take on board any language anywhere in the world um, and all these things are on our roadmap that we want to be able to do um, and between our own vision and passion and also people coming to us asking for particular solutions uh, we feel really well set up now for the future to really be able to deliver sort of uh, for for what can be the hopefully the the most useful transformation of healthcare that we can we can assist with 
Oh, fantastic. And I think especially the US is a big market, quite complex as well, but I'm sure that you're going to tackle it because you can scale it. So one last question related with that. So for instance, if you look at, um, not going into geopolitics, but for instance, a lot of the innovation that is happening, especially in China, an integration of data health care in terms of social scores and, and the even uh, kind of identity score. Is this something uh, that you've been thinking when it comes to your technology and your platform, or for now you trying to tackle just one vertical? At the moment, it's um, sort of very much healthcare minded, but we have had the discussion and we think it could work in a variety of complex areas. There's, there's a raft of generic sentiment analysis tools for things that are quite straightforward and the, 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 they serve their purpose and they do a perfectly good job. But anywhere where it's, there's a lot of different factors. I mean, if I, one we, we sort of identify just as an example is if you think of higher education and universities, the, if you think of students, they, they're, they're paying for their, for their education, but they've got facilities, there's accommodation, there's the quality of the teaching, there's, there's pastoral support. It's a really complex environment. It's a really complex ecosystem. And anywhere where there's lots of different parameters that you're interested in wanting to listen to individuals, um, we, we could have a, a role to play. Um, there's almost that challenge of a startup that there's, there's almost too many things that we could do. And so one of the, the best decisions or some of the best decisions we'll, we'll, we will make will probably be the ones where we say no to certain things or at least no for a while and get the timing right because we need to stay focused on what we can deliver. And so uh, in, the, in the short term, it's going to be making sure that we really uh, nail and deliver a great job for everyone who's coming to us asking for support and help. Oh, cool, Blitter. So, no, Alf, so I, I, I have a lot of things here to ask. Uh, is there, a, to, to wrap up, is there a way for people, there's the video in your platform, but ways to look at uh, some insights? Are you releasing as well any public data about some of the sentiment analysis that you did, for instance, on COVID-19 or things like that? We are. So we are just in starting to prepare to publish a state of the nation report about the whole of the UK over the last three years, including COVID. So it's going to go right up to present time. We're going to be publishing that September, October time. And if people follow us on LinkedIn, on our PEP Health page, or uh, for, keep an eye on our website, pephealth.ai, they'll be, we'll be publicizing that as, uh, as it gets nearer the time. But that's gonna have a raft of insights and particularly, I suppose, insights about the UK, but we could do something similar for, for anywhere else in the world who might be interested as well. Fantastic. So I, I follow up with this and I appreciate your time and, uh, and the fantastic insights. We'll put all these links within the interview and the, the different channels where we're distributing the video and, and sound. I appreciate uh, your time and as well, uh, I wish you all the best, continual success for what you're trying to do. We really need that in the world. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you today. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.